Thanks for listening to the Forest Ramble podcast. Please subscribe and leave a review on your podcast provider, as this helps other Forest supporters find our content. Now on with the pod! Welcome to part two of the Forest Ramble managerial specials. What makes a forest manager? Um, Last time we were talking about the managers who we had um, from Frank Clark through to Joe Kinnear um, and where it all went wrong for them. And now we start on what is, frankly, one of the most depressing bits we could do. Let's talk about Gary Megson with Stephen Topless and the Murad on the Midlands. Um, I think it's fair to say Gary Megson wasn't a good fit for Nottingham Forest Football Club. Stephen? No, he wasn't. And he does go down deservedly as one of the worst managers in Forest history. He was the manager that took us into League One and gave us the unwanted status of being the first European Cup winners to play in the third tier of their domestic league system. And it really just wasn't pretty. And um, it's worth saying that... uh, Robin Chipperfield, in a recent interview in the excellent Bandy and Shinty, now deceased fanzine, um, he said that his worst moment in 20 years of covering Forest was when Forest went down at QPR in the penultimate match of that season because they just went down completely without any fight or pride or anything. And and I think that's the stage that we were all at as fans as well. I just, I remember, I was... I was in a, some retail park in, trying to negotiate my way in or out of a car park and uh, listening to it and just going like that <laughs> because that's what it felt like. It's just like, well, that was inevitable. What? Who cares? What difference does it make? Yeah, it, it, what, it was upsetting, but it wasn't... Sometimes relegations are, they make you distraught and they're just horrible. Yeah, they're, they're emotional experiences. This, yeah. one, this one was kind just of... Just inevitable. yeah. There were so many poor performances. You, you think of the game at home against Plymouth. That was probably where people realised, yeah, we're going down here because a three 0 at home to Plymouth, and it was just diabolical. And you had players like Andy Melville at centre half, mm. who was so far Darryl over Powell. the hill. Daryl Powell, Daryl yeah. Powell, quite, <laughs> and just Mar- 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 on the Midlands um, in the summer. Megson then tried to overhaul the squad. Uh, Des Walker had gone um, other players like uh, you know a few other players had gone as well Alan and Rogers, so, he had a big falling out yeah, with and that's the thing and then there were other players who were still on the books who he had a falling out with David Johnson Alan Rogers being the two high, high profile ones and we ended up having uh, Nicky Eden at right back Gino Padula at left back yeah, you know, names to strike fear into the hearts of the opposition. Uh, Gary Holt signing as, which looked on paper like a good signing, but he never got going either, did he? Um, what was what was the problem with him? If, if you could put it in a nutshell, what was the problem with Megson? He he was a very divisive person. He he, he used um, aggression and say so you say you say managers have two tools, carrot and the stick. He just wants to use a stick. It from everything I've heard, he just wants to punish the players wherever he could. And there's no, there, there's no upside for him. There's no benefit if you do this. Well, we will do this. It was just hard work and shouting. He, he was well known. I mean, it's not his fault necessarily because he was well known for shouting. He just stood on the sidelines at West Brom and shouted at his players for year after year after year, and it worked for them. He, he got them up, and he got them down, and he got them up, and he got them down, and, up. and it. It shouldn't have been a surprise to us that that's what he did at Forest. But it was just a cultural total mismatch. His philosophy was almost anti-Forest. He was he was willfully um, disrespectful about the history of Forest and the style of Forest. And he, he it was his way or, or the highway. And he just, just put too many players on the highway. And he just came across somebody who has a chip on his shoulder... Um, he had a negative time at Forest as a player. He fam- the famous story where Brian Clough saw him vomiting in the toilets and never played mm. him again. And he just felt like he was never going to be successful. It was it was just um, he brought divisions in the in the in the squad and between the team and the player and the fans. And it was just not. And I think work. it's worth saying that there is a widely repeated rumor that um, Forest players actually threw a few matches to try and get rid of Megson. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's pretty much been admitted by, by a couple of players and, and, and some people like Alan Rogers have spoken about it recently and David Johnson. Um, 
I'm not. I mean, I don't agree with that. I think that that's equally disrespectful to the. Club. But again, isn't it just it just represents a sort of yeah. mindset and the culture that was happening at the club at the time. Uh, there's a bit of me, um, and again, my brother as well. We've discussed this and saying maybe when Megson re- releases an autobiography, it'll be interesting to read the chapter about Forrest because we're st- <laughs> there's still something there's still something going on behind the scenes there's talk about drinking culture amongst the players and so on um but whatever it was it was never going to work was no, it i think if when the, the book does come out he'll be scathing about forest and the fans and the players i think mean, the only person he'll have a good word about is probably nigel doughty but i think uh yeah it, it won't it won't be uh, it's, it's worth really. it's worth um remembering that west brom fans still think really highly of gary megson yeah, I mean, why wouldn't they? He, he was immensely successful there. Yeah, he was. Uh, he got them back in the Premier League after almost 20 years out of it. So, and he yeah, did he... it by playing three massive centre-halves, three massive central midfielders and two massive strikers. So maybe that's why it's never going to work at Forest. Yeah. I, if I were to give him some credit, I would say that that very relaxed, almost drinking culture atmosphere, I think it was prevalent in the Forest dressing room and... You know, we can laugh at some of the stories and, you know, where players were taking the mickey out of Megson or disrespecting him. Fine, maybe he went about it in the wrong way. But also, there's a, there is, you've got to have professionalism in the ranks and that, that wasn't there at Forest, whether that was Megson's fault or not. So I, I do think he, he made steps to try and address that, try to bring in some different players. There were players like Grant Holt, Nathan Tyson, who turned out to be pretty decent signings, to be fair. Sammy Klingon came in and he was trying to ship out those who he saw as bad eggs in that Forest dressing room. So that would be the one little sliver of positivity to come from his reign. But quite frankly, he should never have been given the job. He shouldn't have been allowed anywhere near the Forest manager's hot seat. And to be 16th in League One when you've just come down and you're, you've got one of the strongest teams in the division... You're getting pumped five nil at Oldham on New Year's Day. It just really was terrible, and the, three nil away at Chester in the cup. In the cup, yeah. The, just and I just remember the sense of relief when he finally went because it just felt like he was just hanging on to that job and thinking, well, surely th- this week they're going to get rid of him. They've got to get rid of him because there was only one way the club was going, and it was down. Right. I'm not going to dwell on this, but I've got an interesting stat, which is. Uh, after Megson went in February 06, uh, the rest of the season, there's a temporary management partnership of Charlie McParland and uh, Frank Barlow. And they, in all the time uh, since 1993, have got by far the highest win percentage of any management team at the city ground. Played 13, won 8, drew 4, lost 1, 61.5% win rate. And they almost turned a disastrous season where we were almost flirting with playoff contention at the end. And that's because, I'm just going to say, I think it's just because the players were so blooming relieved to have got rid of Megson that they could they could just like go out and do what they do best. Yeah, and uh, McParland and Barlow just let them go and play and express themselves. Uh, I, I heard Charlie talking in the last couple of months uh, about managing Forrest, and he said, we know, more or less said to the players, we know you're good players, just go out and play. Just go out and play. And they were fantastic. It was like night and day watching Megson and then watching Forrest under under these two. Yeah. And for me, it just it just summed up where Megson was going wrong with his style of play, with his attitude towards management and the players. It just didn't work. You saw a completely transformed team. There were no signings made because the transfer window had closed. It was the same squad. Yeah. And they just were tearing teams apart. You had the... 7-1 at home against Swindon. Nicky Southall, creative. Mm-hmm. Just, uh, it was just tearing teams apart on his own and the goals were flying in and we were so, so close to to finishing in the playoffs. I think we I think we beat Yeovil at home on Easter Monday and went into the playoffs. Then we lost the game. I can't remember off the top of my head who against. And we just fell out of the playoffs mm-hmm. and never managed to get quite back in there. Yeah. So... In the end, we finished seventh, which just shows you how 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 much of a good job Barlow and McParland did in that in that short. Or alternatively, spell. how much of a bad job Megson had done. Um, <laughs> right then, the next permanent manager 
was one Colin Calderwood, who had not long won promotion for Northampton, uh, had briefly played for Forest, um, and came in with a reasonable reputation and a reasonable pedigree. Would you agree, Maud, on the Midlands? Yeah, he was seen as an up-and-coming manager at the time. Um, and yeah, he had, had a good reputation. It seemed like and a what positive... did he do to the squad? Uh... I, I, I remember the, trying to remember the players he brought in. I think we had Matt, Matt Lockwood came in from mm-hmm. um, Leighton Orient at left back, so Padula was gone. Uh, who Chambers he, came in eventually. Chambers came in from Northampton, player yeah. he knew. Uh, we had Paul Smith in goal. Hey, Grant Holt on the left wing. Yeah, he did. <laughs> Grant Holt, number 11 on the left wing. Yeah, of course. Uh, Nicky Southall went, which I was a little bit disappointed by at the time because he was he was playing really well and was a creative force. And he, um, yeah, he, he he settled the squad down. He he soon found a, a formation he liked. I seem to remember him liking a three four three at times mm-hmm. at Forest. So there was sort of Chambers, Morgan, I think Kelvin Wilson was in and around oh, the squad uh, at that time uh, yes, as well. Yes. Yes. Uh, Julian Bennett. Yeah. Julian yeah. Bennett eventually came in. Yeah. So, the, yeah, the, it was a it was a functional team. I wouldn't say it was the most. I wouldn't say they played the most beautiful football, but they were certainly effective. And there was for his first season in charge, Forest were top for long spells of it, and then just fell but away. They fell away. And and of course, we most people listening to this will remember how that season ended because it ended with. I mean, if the Sheffield United playoff match was devastating, um, the Yeovil one was embarrassing, wasn't it? It was. We were sort of just torn apart by them in, by the end. And uh, by uh, uh, Chris Cohen and... Uh, Aaron Davis. Aaron John Davis. Davis. Yes. It's easy to forget that we went to Yeovil in the first leg and one, did a good nil. job on them and won 2-0. It was a very professional 2-0 victory, wasn't it? It was. Two penalties. Mm-hmm. James Perch of all people, scoring the second. And it just felt, yeah, we, we've got this now. It's in the bag, more or less, for the second leg. Just don't do anything stupid. Be professional in the second leg and you'll go to Wembley. And, uh, we all, well, we all know what happened next. I, I just it's, I just remember that game just being in stunned disbelief of yeah. what I was seeing. I wasn't even upset. I was just... It was just... And, and the, the, actually, the thing that, that I will remember from that is the fact that, as Forest fans, we were... There wasn't even anger. It, like you say, it was just kind of silence. And then at the end, you know what? Every single Forest fan in their ground stood up and applauded Yeovil. Because it's like, you know what? You were 2-0 down in the first leg and you've come in and you've won the second leg, scoring five goals away from home. Fair play to you. You know, what can you say? We weren't, we weren't good, but you were better. Um, and, you know, <sighs> lesson learnt, though, because next season Forest went out and did it properly. Eventually, somehow, in the, in the end, because... On the last day of the season, having looked out of contention with eight games to go, Forrest did get automatic promotion. They did. Well, we had a, we had a, a bad run again, similar to the to Coldwood's first season, where we were going along okay, we were top, we were right up there. Then we fell away. I remember a game at home against Carlisle, which was on TV. It was a sellout, and it was a top-of-the-table clash. It was like second versus third. We lost that one. Danny Graham scored. And then that looks like automatic dreams were over. And then, like you say, we, the last eight games, we just went on this run, including winning away at Carlisle. Yeah. But then Gareth McCleary scored his first goal for the club. And that was a huge win. And then we just carried that momentum on. We went to Hartlepool in the penultimate game By of the way, season. By the way, signing, if we're talking about signings, Gareth McCleary, £50,000 from uh, Bromley. Oh, Bromley. Bromley, yeah. Bromley. yeah. What a signing that was. But anyway, uh, sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> yeah. And McGugan scored with about 10 minutes left oh, yes. to get a big win at Hartlepool, yes. a 1 0 win that took Forrest into the final day with a chance of automatic promotion. And you know what? I remember going into that game going, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get this and the results are going to go our way. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened because that's what momentum does for you. Yeah. And so. A lot of people will still say, oh, we scraped promotion. And yes, we did. But ultimately, the table doesn't lie after 46 games. So Forrest did it by having a bad streak followed by a good streak. But that's still getting the points on the board. Um, ahead of, And we needed 
results for Cheltenham and uh, Doncaster, Doncaster, Doncaster to go our way. Yeah. Um, and Cheltenham and, beat them, yeah. Yeah, um, so, uh, yeah, Sean O'Drissel's on Doncaster, if I remember rightly. Yeah, it yeah. was, yeah. So, um, so anyway, um, and then when we went up, I think it's fair to say Calderwood had probably reached the limit of what he could do as a manager with that squad and we need and, and the players had possibly maxed out as much as they could at that point because we never quite got going in that division did yeah, we I, th- I think it's I mean from my perspective I think it's more the recruitment we, we just didn't buy enough quality players um, well we bought Robbie Earnshaw he came in from Derby, which I thought was a but great signing. But that was signing. pretty much the only yeah. signing, wasn't it? it Moosey. Was... Moosey came in. That was a Coldwood signing. Moosey. Yep, yep, yep. Moosey yeah. and uh, Joe Garner. I think was a... Garner was already there, I think. But the thing is, is that Moosey was coming in from the French second division. So as much as, as much as he impressed us in those first few matches... He wasn't consistent. No, I just um, remember him cleaning out that Reading defender with, a, <laughs> with an attempted shot that sent him yeah, spiral to the Yeah, that, that, that would have hurt, yeah. yeah. Um, and little Robbie Unsher took two or three games to get going, but obviously, you know what you get. In fairness, that was a very good signing because you know what you can get. You play him. If you play him for 30 games, you're probably going to get 20 goals in that division. Um, and so the big problem with Robbie Earnshaw was in under future managers, he didn't play enough. But that's another story. But, I, but as Sammy said, I don't think Colin necessarily wanted that too many signings. I think that was maybe a, a misjudgment mm-hmm. from his part where he wants to stay loyal to the players he brought yeah, in. Yeah, there's no room for loyalty in football, yeah, is there? I think that, that was maybe a problem as well. But it was, we, we started to struggle. I remember, I remember Andy Cole came in as well. Yeah. Oh, and Andy Cole, yeah. yeah. Um, was a, I will also um, add in that, of course, Chris Commons had left in arguably controversial circumstances oh, to go yes. to Derby. Um, so um, it meant that actually one of the more creative players yeah. wasn't there anymore. A player who, who clearly, as, as history has shown, could adapt to the First Division or the Championship as it, as it is. Um, and it meant that actually there was a... Probably a little bit of a lack of creativity. Yeah, he was he was a very important player. He, he always looked dangerous on the left hand side and, and created lots of chances. Yeah. Mm. So um, it went south for Calderwood and, and a four two defeat at home to Sean O'Driscoll's Doncaster, um, uh, uh, which was a nightmare. Forrest had to make three substitutions in the first half um, due to injuries, and the most notable one being Julian Bennett, whose career at Forest never recovered, um, and. It was just, again, it's one of those things where there's a sense of inevitability, I think, that, that and I remember, yeah, in the car afterwards on the radio, it was like, we've just got a little bit of breaking news, Colin Caldwell has been sacked. Yeah. And we had a couple of matches with uh, John Pemberton's caretaker manager, most notably a 3-0 win away at Manchester City in the Cup with Nathan Tyson doing the single greatest thing he's ever done in a red shirt with that volley from the edge of the area. Some might say the second best thing he's ever, he ever did in the red well, shirt. Well, you know? yeah, we're talking about, we're we'll talking about dur- maybe... dur- during the match. Yeah, okay? we'll, we'll come on maybe to the, uh, to the first one later. John Pemberton, it's interesting to note, 100% win ratio as manager. Yep. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sail, sail that home, John, because that is, uh, that's a nice statistic to have, even if it was only two games. Okay. And then we had the controversial appointment of one William McIntosh Davis. Controversial because he'd previously managed Derby, but also controversial because those of us who like to think of ourselves as football fans who are learned were going, yeah, he's left Preston under a cloud and he's left Derby under a cloud and he's pissed off a lot of people along the way. I just remember his Derby team being terrible to watch. When they, when they got promoted out of this league... And it was the playoff final against West Brom. I remember watching They, it, they weren't supposed to get promoted that year, no, though, were they? <laughs> no, true. But I just thought, how on earth have they won that? The, the better team lost. And they were so far out of their depth in the Premier League and Davis went. And, but, but the worth, point is... Worth pointing out that Billy Davis had a better record as Derby manager in the Premier League than Paul Joule did. And Billy Davis was sacked after two, uh, after two months. Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean... Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 you lost me. I was just like thinking about... Paul Jewell on a car bonnet for some reason. I don't know why. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> Billy <laughs> Billy Davis. Uh, with I, I just remember him coming in with this reputation of 
not playing great football. He, we were all worried he was going to be a yeah. long ball merchant and it, it really wasn't going to be pretty. And perhaps for that first half season when he was here and Forrester in trouble, we needed... That probably wouldn't have been a bad thing because you've got to try and get out of I mean, he, trouble. In, in that sense, there's a, there's a slim parallel with Dave Harry Bassett, which is that Billy Davis tried to get his teams playing according to the strengths of the players he had. So he recruited players who could play football. And his loan signings in that first half season were what made the difference, really, weren't they? Yeah, he brought that bit of quality in. Uh, Dexter Blackstock. Lee Camp. Paul Anderson. Chris Gunter. Anderson was a Calderwood signing, actually. He signed him on loan um, at the start of the season, but he only really started achieving, I suppose. But yeah, Gunter was a big one. Um, And so just and those bits of quality. And then the the crucial one in the following summer um, was Paul McKenna. Yeah. And uh, and then also the one that people made people were going what was that uh, Dealey had a bowler but he proved to be an important oh, signing as well. I'd forgotten about him, yes. Brilliant story that Guy Moosey said on the I think it's on Reservoir Red Dogs podcast where he's saying that um, you used to get fined if you didn't celebrate with your teammates when there was a goal scored, and initially everyone was going oh he's mental, but it did instill this sense of real unity and togetherness. And I've always said one of my favourite things that I, when I see it achieved by a manager is that idea that the team is greater than the sum of its parts. And that odd little tactic by Billy Davis is clearly something that, that really instilled that. And for a short spell in Billy Davis's first full season in charge, I, I, was, I remember like, just wandering around going, we're one of the best teams in the country, never mind in the division. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean we're delusions of grandeur, I suppose you could say. We were, I mean, in our heads... We were already going up, and we, we were talking about going. To, I think Billy Davis made this, uh, did a, a talk at, at one of the uh, fan nights where he talked about going to uh, uh, Old Trafford and, <laughs> and Arsenal and places like and Anfield and, and and taking the mick out of them. And basically, and we were all we were all on board. You can I mean you can criticise Billy Davis as much as you want, but he was a charismatic figure at that time. And he did create a team that played some great football, some winning football, and he was for and the winning mentality. Yeah, and he was at the time a leader of our club, a club that. But and he had a charisma about him as well. He was this was before the egotistical stuff came out. People really latched onto it to him because he came across as a good personality on top of all that as well. But when we get towards that transfer window, so obviously we had the whole saga of have we got a left back. OK, so we had Nicky Shorey, and then Nicky Shorey didn't sign permanently, and then he went to, for a move to the Premier League. Can't blame him for that. And that's when the whole, my job is to recommend and advise oh. uh, business started, OK? And then we have the story that recently came out from Blackpool that, about the playoffs. Now, Stephen, this is a new one that you may not have heard about recently. So do you want to run us through what Gary Taylor Fletcher, ex of Blackpool, said? Yeah, Gary Taylor Fletcher, of course, played in those two playoff semi-finals, And uh, we played Blackpool a few weeks before, uh, sort of five, six weeks before the end of the season. Uh, they weren't in the playoffs. They only snuck in on the final day, but they were sort of starting to make a chart for it. But we went to Blackpool and rested a load of players, more or less put out a second string team and got beat. But after the game, Davis walked around in the bowels of the stadium saying that, you know, that's job done. And if we get you in the playoffs, we'll beat you. And it was a real sign of disrespect. So as if he threw the match so that he could get Blackpool in the playoffs so that then Forrest could batter Blackpool. Yeah. Saw them as an easy touch to get in the playoffs. And yeah. basically did Blackpool's team talk in the playoffs for them. Yeah, so lost the first leg 2-1. And again, Davis is at it in the in the stadium after the game, in the tunnel. You know, job done, boys. We'll get, we'll get them back to the city ground and we'll hammer them and all this sort of talk. And yeah, it was just so unnecessary there's, there's two motivation quotes. for There's Blackpool. two quotes I have from this, from when you shared this story with us. The first one is uh, from the Marid on the Midlands saying, well, that explains why DJ Campbell played like Ronaldo uh, in that other playoff match. Oh, sorry. No, was, I yeah, do apologise. It was Stephen. Um, it's, Stephen comes up with so many quotable moments these days. I, I did a face slapping emoji. That's, that's yes. And, and then the other, one com- the other one comes from Baz, whose uh, comment about Billy Davis was, quote, what a bellend. Um, <laughs> so, but of course, he'd had form for that when he was at Preston. 
and got in the playoffs. I think they he'd been a bell end then as well. That yeah, but he'd gone. They'd gone to Leeds. I think they'd got some form. But they might have got a draw at Leeds or something like that. And he put up in the dressing room after the game, uh, sign saying job done. No, in the press so, dressing room. So, well, bearing in mind that the way he's left the three clubs in, well, actually, if we let's count Motherwell, the way he's left the four clubs where he's been the manager has never been good, has it? He's not someone who learns from his errors. He's not, no. But players absolutely love to play for him. You can see yeah. that. And uh, when he during his second spell in charge, when we uh, we got some unprecedented access. Thanks to Natalie mm-hmm. Jackson and Fawaz, uh, you know you did. To be fair, you did see the players; they they really enjoyed and they still, life under they, Billy Davis. They, they still talk well of him, yeah. like, because I guess he made them believe that they could do more than they ever thought they could. Um, and he was very thorough. I think he was one of the first managers to bring in sort of individual video analysis for each player. And he, and he yeah, and but he, Sam Allardyce was one of the first people to use Opta stats. So well, make of that what you will. Well, you know, <laughs> Billy Davis had his own video editing suite at home. Wee Billy Davis, yeah. Um, And we'll come on to a second spell uh, appropriately. Um, The second season um, where we then, um, you know, didn't play as fluently. Um, Again, we had a problem with left back. We had Ryan Bertrand for the first uh, first part of the season. Um, And there was... Uh, and it ended at Swansea, and it kind of fizzled out. Whereby you thought that Forest should have done better because the Swansea first leg we were playing against ten men for eighty nine minutes. The second leg we just let Swansea steamroll us, and we didn't. Little Robbie Earnshaw wasn't playing from the start, and that was clearly a mistake. Yeah, we brought. I think that was the season we brought in Chris Boyd, wasn't it? And I just, I don't think that worked as a signing really for Forest. It just upset the balance. A little bit there, mm. um, and yeah, it just the season fizzled out. It, it was just wasn't the same as the first. That left back saga rumbled on, didn't it? We had Paul Konchesky in oh, the second yeah. half of the season on loan. Um, I just remember Bertrand's. him getting sent off. Yeah, but he his loan didn't cover the playoffs. So when we actually got in the playoffs, I seem to remember we had Chris Gunzer at left back and then Brandon Mar- Maloney at right yeah. back. And yeah, it was okay, but it, it was a bit of a balance there again. And you could argue that having James Perch at left back the previous season wasn't wasn't helpful to the team no. balance either, and uh, you know it's just these little things. Also, choosing to start McGoldrick and Tyson up front for the second leg, there was a there was some weird stuff going on behind the scenes as well. It was almost like Davis was trying to, I don't want to say throw the game, but he was trying to make the game more difficult than it needed to be to prove a point to the board that he needed more investment. Well, yeah, but his job was to recommend and advise. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So, wasn't <laughs> whether you agreed with it or not, it wasn't necessarily a massive surprise when he was given the boot by Nigel Doughty. And Nigel Doughty's story at the time was: when a manager like Steve McLaren becomes available, then you give him the job. And I think we can sum up Steve McLaren's reign very quickly because he's only there for thirteen matches. He only won three of them. I think everyone admitted it just was never going to work. Um, and so Steve Cottrell came in. That was that was a tough one as well. 37 matches, 12 wins, of which a majority came after Sean O'Driscoll was brought in as a coach. Cottrell, t- Cottrell took a bad situation and made it worse. <laughs> <laughs> and I, we, don't, we paid... I don't know. I don't agree with that. I think he, he saved us from relegation. He, we... In fact, right, right. So the things that Cottrell did that were important before O'Driscoll came in, is that, given the hand he was dealt, so he sold Patrick Bamford, who wasn't close to the first team, for a million and a half pounds. He sold Wes Morgan for a million and a half pounds, and he was able to sign, like, Danny Higginbottom, journeyman player, but he actually added a bit of experience and and, and knowledge to the back. Um, George Ellacobi, do you remember him? Big George Ellacobi. Big George, yeah, came in, and... um, Mullen Herald came back. Yeah, for better or worse. Yeah. Um, but but the, the, the whole thing about McLaren was that he was completely ill-prepared for the championship, made terrible signings, and he left. He took a, a well-organised team and made them completely disorganised yeah. and an absolute shambles. So what what Steve Cottrell did first and foremost was to just get them a bit more organising and get them playing with a bit of shape and then take it from there. 
And um, I, I think he was dealt with very harshly, to be honest with you. Not well, I mean, certainly the way in which he was dispatched, where he went for a meeting with the new Al Hasawi regime, Fawaz Abdulaziz, and cousin Omar, remember him? <laughs> yeah, um, and and then was told, yeah, you've got a job here. And then the next day he was sacked over the phone, I believe. <laughs> um, and then Forrest had no manager. We've had plenty of discussion about Sean O'Driscoll in the past. I very much think of him as the one that got away. And the thing that I like about Sean O'Driscoll is um, that he was a man, again, who had a footballing philosophy. He understood the difference between tactics and formations. He also wasn't one to panic. He wasn't one to panic. And sure, it wasn't all golden moments under O'Driscoll. But when you consider that O'Driscoll had to put a team together with three weeks to go before the start of the season and no money. So he cobbled together this team um, of the only money he really spent in terms of big money was Simon Cox for £2 million. Pounds. But apart from that, he cobbled together a team of players like Dan Harding and Danny Collins and, and so on, uh, Elliot Ward on loan. And so he, he, he did all right to get us into eighth position on Boxing Day when he was unceremoniously sacked. I think he did a fantastic job. But it's OK, because we got some big screens that day. Yeah. And, uh, but unfortunately, O'Driscoll, he was boring in his interviews, and that's what mattered at the end of the day, certainly in the eyes of some people, uh, which, yeah, that used to bother me. Uh, just unnecessary criticism he got. You could just see what he was trying to do with that team, and we all knew that O'Driscoll's teams played good football before he came, before he came into Forest. And I would point out as well, the win percentage under O'Driscoll is 38.5, which is um, not bad at all in comparison to some of the other managers that we've had. Really isn't. Um, so yeah. even though he's only in charge for 26 games, he won 10 of those. Yeah, they lost seven of those um, and drew nine. But um, I think we could all see there was an upward trajectory. And that was rudely interrupted by the sacking of O'Driscoll, the appointment of McLeish, which, again, was never going to work out. And McLeish, to be fair to him, all reports say that, you know, he was there for, what, 33 days and he conducted himself with the utmost dignity, immediately realised that he'd been sold a pup and then just walked away. Um, so that led to William McIntosh Davis, Mark II, with unfinished business. It is what it is. Um, no comment. And... Billy Davis, immediately, now married on the Midlands, in part one, you'd said about how Frank Clark had realised the value of keeping the backroom staff and the structure of the club and keeping the fabric of the club together. Billy Davis, Mark II, completely ripped that to shreds. Yep, it was like he was in a personal vendetta um, to exact revenge against people at the club. For uh, whom? Nigel Dash, he wasn't there anymore. No, but he, he just had a very big chip on his shoulder. And he just, um, it was all about him. And, uh, yeah. OK, I'm going to point something out, though. Win percentage, 42.3%. <laughs> 59 matches. He was in charge for uh, 13 months, nearly 14, and won 25 of those. But he was sacked after a 5-0 defeat away at Derby. Yeah. Do you think if it hadn't been at Derby that he wouldn't have been sacked or, and or, do you think that if it wasn't the fact that Fawaz spent his Saturday nights on Twitter listening to a vocal proportion of Forest fans that Billy Davis wouldn't have been sacked? Because you look at the bare stats and it looks as though Billy Davis did pretty well, but then you think about what it was like at the time and it was horrible. It's it embarrassing it's, to be a Forest to remember that he went on a very good run at the beginning of that, that second... Um, Second reign, we went win six in a row or something, yeah. and by the end of it, the the it was the team spirit had gone. They weren't playing for him, and it was just a very very dispirited looking team, um, which led to that five 0 defeat. Because we were, were, were not a brilliant derby side. We weren't playing against Barcelona or anything. It was uh, it was Derby County. Well, I mean, we were hit by a lot of injuries at the time, but that's not really excusing a five 0 win against your rivals, but. It's, uh, yeah, just all the distraction, all the destruction that was being brought to the club from Billy Davis, it was getting out of hand. You also, don't forget, had Jim Price, his cousin, who I think had been struck off as a lawyer a few years before. Well, I mean... He'd basically come in and was running things alongside Billy Davis, was running the club alongside Billy Davis. But he wasn't allowed to be on the board of directors, was he? He had to be called, no. like, a 
football consultant or something something like that, or general manager, because of him having been struck off, he wouldn't pass a fit and proper person's test. Um, I think what's just as important is the fact that many journalists, not just the Forest supporting ones like John Percy and Danny Taylor, um, but many other journalists were just saying that Forest are an absolute disgrace. Many other clubs refused to do business with Forest, and the chairman like Darren McAntony at Peterborough um, who aren't worried about going, you know, about sort of going on the record about these things, just said, Forrest has screwed us over. We rely on that kind of income and they're screwing us over. And Forrest were just an absolute, you know, laughing stock in the footballing world at that moment in time, down to the running of the club by Fawaz. And let's be honest, OK, let's not forget that by that point, Abdulaziz had given up um, he'd become a silent partner and given up some of his shares. Cousin Omar had been vaporised to the point whereby his chairmanship had actually been erased from the board of chairs at Forest on the list. So Cousin Omar had basically been purged. Um, like, and, and so the club was in the hands of Billy Davis, Jim Price and Fawaz al Hasawi, And they're an absolute laughing stock. Absolute laughing stock, and he gave that press conference at the end of the season, which was before the match, so he could basically, um, basically take a pot shot at all the people he wanted to have a go at, <laughs> and that kind of thing. It's just it's no way to conduct yourself in a professional environment. Um, so Gary Brazil took over for a bit. Then we had the announcement that Stuart Pearce was going to take over, and Stuart Pearce had media commitments, but he spent a lot of time at the City Ground, and then he came in and he wanted to do the job properly both as a coach, but also as a manager, as an administrator. Um, Murdoch on the Midlands, what's your take on Stuart Pearce's 32 games at the City Ground? Um, I think he started very well. He, he made some very vital changes to the squad um, and to the structure of, of the club. He, he, he got out some dead wood from the club. Uh, and just... Unfortunately, the, the results didn't match um, the early season promise uh, later on, and, and and the pressure sort of was built built on him. And, and the way football is now, he he was sort of forced out. I think prematurely, in my opinion. I I didn't like the way that the fans turned on him, and I mean we moan now about social media, but it was going on then as well. You fans turning on him after ten games in charge because we'd lost a couple. We'd had a bit of a bad run and it was just, it just started to create a tide against him. And for for a man like Stuart Pearce, somebody who'd shown so much loyalty to Forrest, as we spoke about in part one, when he could have left after relegation in, in 93, but he stayed, he stayed loyal when he could have moved to bigger clubs. And our fan base couldn't give him more than a couple of months as manager, I, I, I thought that was disgraceful, actually, how some people treated Stuart Pearce. And, and, and here we come on to an issue which we've discussed many times, which is this is around this time that the generation gap between fans was really starting to show. So for people who are, broadly speaking, 30 and over, um, you'll remember that Stuart Pearce is regarded... Because even if you weren't able to see him play, you'll have, rem you'll have had your dad talking about it, you'll have seen the videos of some of his free kicks and stuff, and you'll have respected that. Um... If you are a fan who's under 30, then Billy Davis is the best manager that Forrest have had in your lifetime. Um, that getting to the playoffs two seasons in a row is the finest achievement that Forrest have had in your lifetime. Um, therefore, Stuart Pearce not getting results, um, despite the fact that, you know, I think there's two things that are key to the Stuart Pearce regime falling apart. Number one was... Early in the season, that derby match where he lost Andy Reid, Chris Cohen and Jack Hobbs for the rest of the season, all in one one match. Um, his three captains, his three first choice, um, you know, first names on his team sheet. And then Britta Sambalonga um, was scoring goals really well. And it was around then that Britt got injured, wasn't it, as well, just towards yeah. the end of his reign. And so the things that he could rely on were all gone. And so that was unfortunate for him. But then, yeah, well, where do you go from there? Yeah, I, my thoughts at the time, and they still are now, if, Stuart Pe if you can't give Stuart Pearce time in the job, nobody stands a chance. That's how I felt at the time. And uh, it was, yeah, it was just a shame because 
it could have been it could have been great under Pierce given time. Who knows? It might it might not have worked out, but it would have been at least nice to have. It was at given worst. Him the it was at worst a, a mid season blip or a mid season dip in form. We've seen plenty of teams that go. It's, it's such a long season, the championship. So many games that. Well, my 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 take on it was actually I'd I would have liked to have seen similar to when Cottrell was in charge. I'd have liked to have seen a Sean O'Driscoll, someone who's really got football philosophy and tactics running through their veins come in and assist now whether Pierce would have accepted that or not I don't know but I think it's fair to say that Pierce was doing an exceptional job off the pitch but tactically he was being found out a little bit perhaps a little bit and as you alluded to there with losing three of your key players you take key players out of any team they're going to struggle to lose them all in one match that too yeah and um but I mean certainly off the pitch and his transfer business, they were very good. He had a real eye for a player. Bringing in Antonio for 1.8 million, I think, or it might have even been 1 million from Sheffield one Wednesday. Half, I think, yeah. One and a half, yeah. And then turning him into a 7 million pound player, showing form which he never... If West Ham were to sell Antonio now, he'd be 15 million, wouldn't he? That's it. So you've got British Sombolonga, okay, he cost 5 million pounds, but we sold him for 15. So Stuart Pearce did some really good business in the yeah. transfer market. And, um, yeah, I, th- I think I wish things could have been a bit And different. also, bearing in mind, again, the fabric of the club was non-existent when Stuart came in. No. He had, he had to try and rebuild. He tried to get a chief executive in who then walked out almost as soon <laughs> as. Paul saying, Faulkner, wasn't yeah, it? Paul yeah, Paul Faulkner, who was a respected football administrator. And he walked out saying, I can't... I'm not wanted here. I can't do my job here. Um, so Stuart was up against it in that respect as well, um, which actually makes the next incumbent of the manager's hot seat, Dougie Friedman, makes his achievements. I think he was unfairly maligned, Dougie. I thought he did a, a decent job in very difficult circumstances. I think what didn't help with Dougie was Stuart Pierce. his departure was announced around about six o'clock on a Sunday evening. So obviously, you know, Gutting news, your club legend has gone and one of your, your favourite players. And then within an hour, Friedman was announced as manager. It was such a quick turnaround in terms of the new man coming in. I just thought, well, you've obviously negotiated that while Stuart Pearce yeah. is still and in the, the job. The other thing, of course, is that Dougie, for those who are old enough to remember, was an underwhelming player at Forest. He was a player who never quite lived up to what we hoped he would be when he was at Forest. Um, but then Dougie was also dealt an even more difficult hand because he had a transfer embargo. And so that makes his win record of basically 33.3%, uh, a third, 57 matches, 19 wins, makes it look almost Herculean when you consider that he had players who were out, when you consider that um, that he couldn't get any players in other than a few loans. Um, and of those loans, he did do well with players like Nelson Oliveira, for instance, um, Ryan Mendes what happened to him I don't know but he had half a season where he looked really quite good um, so I don't know what's your there, take there's just no need to sack him at that point when he, he just came completely out of the blue I remember it was a sun, another Sunday afternoon mm-hmm. sacking and it just there was absolutely no need the, cl- the season was sort of petering out into mid-table obscurity yep. and it just it just seemed like another crazy decision by Fawaz, another one. It just for absolutely no reason just caused more upheaval. And then because Fawaz didn't know what to do next, he gave the caretaker role to Paul Williams, who was Dougie's number two. Well, what's the point in doing that? If you don't have belief in the manager, why would you appoint his number two as, as, as the caretaker? Um, and then, again, proving that Fawaz didn't actually have a blooming clue about football, he appointed Philippe Montagnier. Nice guy, knew, was, was being parachuted into a... As we said about David Platt in part one, when you're going into a really tough division, a really even division, unless you are really knowledgeable and full of the kind of the sort of the culture and the way in which the championship works, you're going to struggle. And Philippe Montagna, I mean, bless him, he was good value. He was good value. He was good fun. He gave a good interview, and he seemed like a really decent guy. <laughs> but on a hide into nothing again, wouldn't he? Oh, I, li- I liked Montagna. He came in with a good reputation. He'd done some fine work at, with Real Sociedad and, and teams in France getting a couple of sides into the Champions League and playing really good football. Uh, I, I, I liked Montagna. He had the potential to be... If you look now at, say, Nuno Santo at Wolves, where he's come in, continental manager, and he's come in and he's, he just worked. 
it was potential for that with Montagnier, but they just, it just think, was that, never going to happen. The we, foundations we, weren't there for it to happen. We knew, no, he had much better players or has much better players. And he, I think it's more of a steely sort of force of determination behind. I think Philippe Montagnier was maybe a bit too nice. Nice, <laughs> nice to be a well, I mean, I'm, I'm Boris also, also going to go back to some of the stuff that we, we said sort of around these, these times, which is that from basically the O'Driscoll sacking onwards, to a certain extent, it doesn't... Let's take Billy Davis Mark II out of the equation because that was anomalous by anyone's standards. But apart from that, it doesn't really make any difference who the manager is because the club is in such disarray. You could, you know, you could have anyone in charge in, in, the, in the managerial hot seat. It wouldn't make that much difference, no. I don't think. So, you know, we'll skip over Montana. He had a record where he, he had played 30, won nine, a win ratio of, of 30%. Um, there were some really glaring times of, of where you kind of thought, yeah, he, he's not he's not up to it in this division, and there were some there were some decent times as well. So I think you know, just before we move on from Montagnier, it was around the time when he was appointed was when the name Evangelos Maranakis was first brought up as a potential buyer for Forest. Yeah, and I was I think the story was that a takeover could have gone through around that time, but it didn't. The belief was from several sources that Montagnier was a Maranakis appointment, and that that appointment was being put in place. Director of football and some of the recruitment was being done, basically being done by Fawaz on behalf of mm-hmm. Maranakis, with a view to when the takeover goes through, it's a smoother transition. I don't know if that's true; it could be might be completely false. But when that takeover didn't go through in that summer. Did that also undermine Montagnier? Because if it's true that Maranakis was the person who effectively appointed him, then well, he didn't get the opportunity to, to see through that job properly because the support wasn't there for him. This does segue neatly onto... Uh, so there was a period where Gary Brazil was appointed not as the caretaker, but as the interim manager. But then that was short-lived because after a couple of months, Mark Warburton was appointed. Now, again... That was rumoured to be a Maranakis appointment. Um, and with Warburton, well, we've discussed it plenty of times because obviously at the time we discussed it. Um, Warburton was one of those who, OK, the things that people will remember, people will remember his interviews where he, you know, he came from a background in, in, in the city, in finance, and he came across like someone who had that background. He also was lambasted for his lack of a plan B when it came to tactics and as I've talked about many times, tactics and formations aren't the same thing. So he did say, oh, well, I changed to three at the back or I changed to playing, uh, you know, wide men or whatever. That's not tactics. That's formations. So he showed a, maybe a little bit of naivety in that respect. But on the other hand, Warburton did come with a footballing philosophy for better or for worse. And again, maybe he tried to overstretch the players to a level that they couldn't cope with, like Jordan Smith having to play it out from the back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um but in terms of the type of appointment, you could tell it maybe wasn't a Fawaz appointment because, firstly, we knew that Fawaz was probably going to be on his way by that point. And secondly, the type of appointment, the fact that it was a slightly more cerebral manager, suggests it wasn't a Fawaz choice. So what's your overall view of Warburton's reign in summary, now that a bit of water's gone under the bridge? Yeah, I, I, I liked what he wanted to do with the team. Uh, a, a focus on youth and playing a passing game based on possession. I thought that's exactly what we what we should be aiming for at Forest. Uh, trying to pick up a bit from where Sean O'Driscoll had left off in terms of trying to bring a certain ethos into the club that runs throughout from the first team right through to the academy players and having that style that the whole any everybody associated with the club buys into and all the players play it at whichever levels they are but yeah maybe it was just uh, he, he wasn't supported enough financially there was you know he didn't bring in enough experience alongside that youth just to give them that that bit of steel and uh, to give the team a bit more strength in uh, competitively if you like um, but so, there was some great football played under Warburton at times uh, unfortunately yeah, the team just wasn't strong enough to, you know, to stay in the top half for long, and we soon started falling down the table, and results fell away. His win percentage was forty point five, but yeah, there was there was a, a rather 
poor run. Now, what's interesting, in 37 matches, Warburton's Forest only drew three of them. They, uh, they won 15 and they lost 19. They only drew three matches. And I think that was something whereby um, the next incumbent of the hot seat, Karanka, was, was like lambasted for getting too many draws. Warburton didn't get enough. And if he'd managed to turn some of those defeats into draws, his record would have looked even stronger. Um, but I think it's, it's a, it is a bit of a strange one because he did show himself up in some ways, but in other ways, it was a very progressive appointment. The other thing I will say, and Marriage on the Midlands, and if you'll have an opinion on this, is that actually, if you look at Warburton's managerial record, the three jobs he's had, so Forest, Rangers, Brentford, he's left all of those in circumstances where people are going, oh, he's a bit unfortunate. And is that a pattern that's kind of a bit alarming? You can't be unlucky all the time, can you? Um, yeah, I think there's different reasons. I think at, at Brentford, he wanted more control and he didn't agree with the, the board's way of recruiting. And, and so it was just a parting of the ways because of the philosophy. Uh, Rangers, I can't remember what happened there now. He was reasonably successful, but I can't remember why he left there now. And um, at Forest, it was just, it's, it, there's, there's some parallels with what's happened with Sari at Chelsea, whereas on paper, uh, the results look okay. And uh, he's trying to do the right things, play football. But the fans just didn't take to him. And it wasn't necessarily entertaining football. You can have passing football without it being entertaining. And it was really boring at times under Warburton. And it was just playing football for the sake of playing football. It's not It's not yeah. the same thing as having playing football with a purpose. As, as, a, as a reason to play, play, play passing football. But it's, it's not for the, just for the sake of playing passing football. So if we move on to Karanka, so it contrasted the number of draws he got. Now, what was interesting is that um, Warburton was sacked at the very end of 2017 and Karanka came in in January uh, of 2018. And in that first half a season, two things were notable about Karanka. One, most obviously, was the sheer number of signings he made. He basically overhauled the squad, got rid of a lot of the players as we've discussed on many occasions, who just were not only lacking in ability, but their mentality was gone. They were, they were schooled into Forest being a very mediocre team. Um, and so Karanka wanted to overhaul that in terms of the mentality as well as the ability. But then the other thing is, in that first half of the season, Karanka didn't care about possession. It's like, there's no point having possessions for possession's sake. Let's strip it back. If it means we're sitting back and not having the ball, that's fine as long as we make the most of it when we do. And, of course, that's what saw a reasonable enough set of results that Forrest escaped relegation. And then he built on that in the summer to try and get a team that was more comfortable in possession, that was able to use the ball better and that was able to be more consistently attacking for half a season. For half a season. And I was going to go back to this point uh, with Stuart Pearce, but... By the time Stuart Pearce came in, we were we had we were in that cycle of managers coming and going. We were very much into this merry-go-round of we'd get to January, having had a decent first half of the season with maybe a slump over Christmas. The manager would go, season's practically over. Whether that a new manager or a caretaker came in, we'd get to the end of the season, look to go again the following season, start well, fall away. Get to January, yeah. another manager comes in. Yeah, and it was just a, a bad cycle that we got ourselves into. And uh, it's, it just seemed to manifest itself again. Well, I mean... But not they, so much in different circumstances yeah. from Karanka's point of view. Slightly different in that Boris were in the top half of the table and yeah. looking like potential playoff challengers. Yeah. So uh, the, going back to something that you mentioned earlier, the Sunday factor. Billy Davis, Mark 1, went on a Sunday. McLaren went on a Sunday. Uh, McLeish, I think, went on a Sunday, if I remember rightly. Um, Stuart Pearce, Dougie Friedman, Philippe Montagné all went on a Sunday. <laughs> so there was a thing, wasn't there? It's like, it's a Sunday, there must be another forest manager going today. Um, and so, but what that's proving is that, again, there was that cycle and it just became, it became depressingly predictable. And you look at some of the departures we've talked about in the last 10 years, so many of them have gone in December, January, March, uh, December, January, February, March, um, because it's just like, yeah, midway through the season, not going the way we want, let's rip it up and start again, which has got us, well, precisely nowhere. Yeah, and my argument against that has always been that we've needed a manager to be in place for at least a full season to stamp some authority mm -hmm. on the club, 
and on their own position because players then know that this manager is here to stay no matter... And I think that Maranakis, from what we can tell, wanted Karanka to do that, but Karanka didn't. No, and we we don't know the full story of what happened behind the scenes, but the general gist of it is we were going along nicely up until December. We'd been in the playoffs. We hadn't been up there all season, but we we got our way in, got into some good form. We beat Ipswich at home. Then the post-match interview was a bit strange from Karanka. Something definitely seemed off. And then the results that December, we lost at home to QPR for the very first time. Lost at home to Preston as well. You know, we had some poor, poor results. And then we had the Boxing Day game at Norwich, where we threw threw away a three-goal lead. And it looks like Karanka was going to go after that match. Whatever was happening behind the scenes, it had come to that point where he was going to go, and then he wasn't. And uh, Gilles Diaz, who obviously left the club shortly afterwards, uh, described it in a translated interview as a collective meltdown. So clearly that was transmitted from the manager down when you read between the lines. The manager had lost his head for whatever reason, um, and then the players, it transmitted down to the players. So, just in uh, in the space of uh, 30 seconds, Stephen, out of those 21 managers that we've talked about, who's been your least favourite? Megson. Married on the Midlands? Probably Megson. Okay, and then who do you think has been your favourite? Not necessarily the best, but your favourite manager in that time. Based on the quality of football, based on how he achieved what he did, Paul Hart. Okay. It's always going to be Frank Clark for me. Okay. (laughs) And then, the other question, who's been the best manager in those 20, or out of those 21 managers in 26 years? Got to be Frank Clark. To come in after Brian Clough in a very, that is a difficult circumstance when you're following what essentially was a legacy. And to come in and pick things up and carry that team forward, get them into the play and into the Premier League at the first attempt to to finish third. That's a remarkable achievement. Uh, You know, people go on, we're going on last season about Wolves finishing seventh and saying, oh, oh, they're the best promoted team we've ever seen. (laughs) Yeah. Right. (laughs) You know, you just come on, have a word. That Forest team was fantastic. And Clark, Clark got it spot on. Okay, married on the Midlands. Ditto. That's it for now. I wish to say a big thank you and goodbye to Stephen Topless. Thank you. And a thank you and goodbye to the married on the Midlands. Ciao. Uh, I'm Rich Ferraro, and we will be back with more musings and witterings throughout the season come August. <laughs>